Scripture reading tonight is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Well, turn with me from Psalms to Proverbs, please. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. It's good to be back with you this afternoon. Appreciated the warm welcome I received this morning. Dan has just told me so much about the love that this congregation has shown him. And truly, you lived up to all the good things that he has said. I appreciate just the kind, warm welcome. And especially appreciate the fact that I can tell so many of you are just chewing on the bread of life. As a preacher, I can cut up the word and try to serve it, but then it's up to the hearer to chew it and to digest it. And I could tell there was so much chewing and meditating and digesting of the word of life this morning and just really appreciate your intent and your focus and dedication that you have to the scriptures. Appreciate again the invitation to be with you this afternoon. So this afternoon what I would like to do is kind of follow up to the lesson this morning, but talk about a Christian worldview. And for that, we are going to go to Proverbs. Now, the question I would like to pose this afternoon is, how can we stay rooted in a chaotic world? So this morning's lesson was more or less a lesson in negative apologetics. What I mean by that is, whenever there's an issue to arise, this is how you confront it. The lesson this afternoon is much more a lesson in positive apologetics. How do you frame a Christian worldview to where you won't even have to answer objections? What we are going to try to do this evening is try to establish a Christian worldview and really try to understand how can we stay rooted in a chaotic world. Now, again, this doesn't take much explanation in light of so much that Dan has said and and what I said this morning. We live in a chaotic world. When it comes to ethics, when it comes to morality, when it comes to identity, when it comes to religion, when it comes to communication, there's so many ways in which the world around us is just chaos and a continual cacophony of differing voices. How can we stay rooted in this chaotic world? So to answer this question, we are going to go to the book of Proverbs and first deal with the way of the world. The proverb author is going to give us two ways. And the first way that he offers is the way of the world. Proverbs 1 verse 10, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive. And whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We all have one who pursue. My son, do not walk with them. Hold back your foot from their paths. For their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain they spread the net in sight of any bird. But those men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush. For their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. Here's the basic truth that Solomon gives his son. The world entices. The world entices. Now, from the scripture just read in Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. That same progression is here introduced in more poetic sense in Proverbs 1. Sinners are going to entice you to walk with them, to stand with them, to sit with them. Beware of their enticements. And again, this is not a claim that takes much explanation to warrant. But the world entices us in so many different ways. 
No matter what God from the pantheon of the age is enticing our hearts, there is going to be something that Satan uses, that ancient deceiver, to entice us and to lure us in to the wickedness of the age. So the world will entice us. No matter whether it comes in the form of sexuality, whether it comes in the form of money, whether it comes in the form of relationships or of power or of greed or whatever, whatever other God Satan may put in front of us, the world is going to entice us. Yet, because the world entices us, here is what Solomon continues. Proverbs 1 verse 20. Proverbs 1 verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the marketplaces, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Wisdom here, personified as a woman, is sitting in the gates at the marketplace, and she looks around and she sees all of these vain men just running around, distracted in the chaos of this age. She then looks at them and she cries, verse 22, How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Here's what wisdom understands. Wisdom understands the world knows nothing. The world knows nothing. Now, young people, I'll talk to you for a minute. This is a lesson that you need to learn from Solomon rather than experience. There are far too many of us who were raised in Christian homes that like to, in the youth of our age, dabble in the world and its enticements. And then I'll tell you, now 29 seeing so many that I have been with the last 10 years of my life from 18 to 29, I cannot begin to count the number of close brothers and sisters in Christ that have simply left the world because of enticements. I can remember my last year at FC, the graduation speech, which typically I couldn't remember any that have ever been said. They're so boring. But this one was really fascinating. Um, it was a preacher who had lost his wife that year. And he looked at us and said very soberingly, you're 18, 19, maybe 20 at this time. When you come back for your 10-year reunion, I'm going to venture to say 10 of you will have been divorced. At least five of you will have can cancer. A few of you will have died. Wait for the enticements of this world to catch up. Well, he underestimated that big time. My 10-year reunion is about to come up. I guess, Austin, that's your grade two, right? 08. It's crazy, isn't it? The world entices the world entices, and it makes itself to be so pretty. It makes itself to be so alluring. It makes itself to be so satisfying. Yet, wisdom is above all of this. Wisdom looks down at the simple ones who are running around the streets, who are just trying to get ahead in life, who are trying to make a gain, who are trying to pursue everything this life has to offer. And wisdom says, stop it. Stop being simple, stop being foolish, and understand the way that you're on is foolish. The world knows nothing. And because of the recognition of woman wisdom, she is going to give another path. She is going to offer, don't walk the way of the wicked. And as you continue over into Proverbs chapter 2, she is going to begin instruction again do not fall into this way of the wicked. Now, let me give you a basic structure of the book of Proverbs. Many of you are studying this and probably already know it. Proverbs has two, two main sections to it. Proverbs 1 through 9 is all about the purpose of wisdom. Proverbs 10 through 31 are principles of wisdom. So as you work through Proverbs, it has to be read as two related but distinct sections. Because what Solomon is going to do in the first nine chapters is explain the purpose of wisdom. Why do you need wisdom? Why is it so important? Then what he's going to do in 10 through 31 is offer principles of wisdom and demonstrate to you what wisdom actually is. Those are the short sayings and the maxims that he offers. But what the author is doing here in this section is telling you why do you need wisdom? Well, we need wisdom because all of us are going to be enticed by the way of the world. Again, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. My son, 
If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. Guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints, then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity in every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in evil doing and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their way. What is the second way that he offers? You don't have to walk the way of wickedness. You do not. You do not have to walk the way of the fool, of the scoffer. If you're wise, you will walk the way of the righteous. Being delivered from the hands of scoffers and wicked men, you can walk the way of the righteous. And so, verse 20, so you will walk the way of good and keep the paths of righteousness for the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. So here's the choice. Very candidly, you either walk the way of the righteous or the way of the wicked. Now, we can look at this up on a screen, and I think the choice is pretty evident, right? Walk the way of the righteous, right? I think we all know which one to walk. But now let me ask this. The way of righteousness is filled with wisdom and knowledge and understanding and insight and purpose. Key word from this morning, meaning. The way of the fool is with darkness and ignorance and scoffing and evil doing. Which path would each of us really like to be on? Of course the way of the righteous. But here's the question. If this choice seems so easy, I mean, this is not a hard choice, is it? I mean, it's like you go to Baskin Robbins sometimes, especially during pumpkin season. Oh, man. Do you get pumpkin ice cream or do you get their mint chocolate chip ice cream? That's a decision that takes some effort. The correct answer is pumpkin. But which one do you get? This is an easy one. I mean, this is an easy one. Walk the way of the righteous because goodness and uprightness and meaning are found here. But why do so many in the world walk the way of the wicked? Well, for this, I think we have to understand the difference in walking here is not just where the feet go, but the feet are led by something else. How do we find the way of the righteous? Again, this choice is so easy but so difficult to practice. How do we find the way of the righteous? Proverbs 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching. Now I'm going to stop here simply because you're having a class on this. In the original text, do you know how Proverbs 3, 1 reads? My son, do not forget my Torah. The Old Testament word Torah is much, much, much better translated teaching than it is law. As it's used in the wisdom literature, and perhaps Josh and Dan have already talked through this, and I'm just coming on the back end of it. But Proverbs really exemplifies this point. Torah is instruction. It's teaching. The law of Moses is best understood as the teaching of Moses. And what you have here in Proverbs chapter 3 is the Torah of Solomon. This is the teaching of Solomon. This is now Solomon looking back on life and saying, this is my instruction. And you can understand him especially taking the role of a father. Son, this is what I want you to know. And especially becoming a parent two years ago, oh, this section is so much more important. Because as a parent, as a father, 
These are the things I want my children to know. This is what Solomon says. My son, verse 1, do not forget my Torah, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will be added to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Notice especially verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. What is the key, the secret, the instruction that's necessary to walk the way of the righteous? It's so simple. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. With all your heart. Now, let's really disentangle this verse for the next few minutes. What does it mean to trust in the Lord with all your heart? We have to focus in here on the heart. Now, this is a term that is loaded in our culture because we see the heart as the emotional center of man. What I'm going to try to do is offer a more biblical definition of what the heart is. From a biblical perspective, the heart is really seen as the core of who I am. It's your core, it's your center, it's who you are. Because it goes down to your very roots. It goes down to the very depth of who you are. Notice back to Deuteronomy chapter, see, let's do Proverbs first. Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 5. Here, you will understand the fear of the Lord. You will find the knowledge of God. These are good things that will happen to you. Verse 10. Wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Now, in Hebrew, this is called parallelism, where he's taking a thought and just repeating it another way. Do you notice here the connection between the heart and the soul? From a biblical perspective, your heart is the core, the very center of who you are. Why in Deuteronomy chapter 6 did Moses instruct the children of Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart? Here's what he's saying. Love God to the very core of your being. Love God to the very core of your being. And for this, I'd like to use an illustration. And I'm going to call upon an old childhood friend of mine. I'm going to call upon Santa Claus. So some of you may already look at this and know what this is. This is a Russian nesting doll. And if you look at the outside here of Santa Claus, you'll of course notice that here we have an outer layer of Santa Claus. But then if you go one level deeper, his face is a little bit different, but this is still Santa Claus. It's still Santa Claus. Well, then you go one level deeper, and his face is here a bit rosier. Oh, but it's still Santa Claus. And then you go one level deeper. You still find Santa Claus. And you go to the very core of this doll, and there's Santa. This is the heart of man. If you take me down to the very center, down to the very core of who I am, that's what the Bible calls my heart. Do you really know someone? Do you feel like you know someone down to the very fiber, the very core, the very center of their being? That's the heart. That's the heart. And biblically what we are commanded to do is to love and to trust and to fear the Lord down to the very core of our being. We cannot love God with mind alone. We cannot love God with emotion alone. We cannot love God with soul alone. We must love God with mind, soul, strength, down to the very depths of our heart. And that is what Solomon is urging his son to do. You can just imagine Solomon understanding the follies of his own life and understanding. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man who understood you have to fear the Lord and love Him with all your heart. 
Solomon, this was his problem. It didn't get to the heart. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree that is planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. Do you notice the characteristic of the righteous man? The righteous man is like a tree that's planted. What does a tree have to have? Roots. Our heart is our roots. It's taking us down to the very core of who we are. But the heart also has a second part to it. The heart is the very depth of who I am. But whenever I get down to the heart, that heart then is going to shape every last thing that I do in every avenue of life. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. How are we to trust the Lord? How are we to fear the Lord? In what context and where? Everywhere. Everywhere. In every facet of life, trust in the Lord. In every facet of life, trust in the Lord. Because you'll understand, when you have the heart... Every layer is built on top of it. To even when you go to the outermost level of who I am, it still goes down to the heart. Brethren, biblically what we are called to do is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, to trust Him, to fear Him, to look to Him out of reverence, out of fear, out of love. And when we do that then, then every last facet of who I am is going to be molded after God's image. This, I would argue, is both the depth of who we are, but also the breadth of who I am in every way. Now, let me go back to this idea of identity. And this idea of who I am and positive apologetics. I'm going to use another metaphor here. Whenever I was a decade ago picking out Jessica's engagement ring, it was terrifying. I knew nothing about jewelry. One of the first things I had to decide was how many prongs to get on that ring. Now women, go ahead and start counting. Every time I use this, people start counting. Count how many prongs are on the ring. Originally, I talked to a few jewelers and had tried to get Jessica's opinion without her really knowing what I was doing. I think she knew what I was doing. But anyhow, I tried to figure out how many prongs to get. Originally, I decided four. Four prongs. We'd been married about two years. One of the prongs broke. She looked down and saw it and saw the diamond was about to fall out. We both would have been sick. So let me tell you what we did. We took it back to the jeweler and they put six prongs on. That diamond hasn't moved an inch. How pronged is your faith? How pronged is your faith? Let me explain what I mean by this. If you have one prong holding up your faith, worship. Whenever a storm of life comes, is that faith going to withstand? Let's say you have two prongs. You trust the Lord in worship and you trust Him in marriage. But all that stuff about work and recreation and communication and language and actions and entertainment, all that's left still for my own wisdom. What happens? Two prongs break. Brethren, here is what each of us need to cultivate. A six-pronged faith. Trusting the Lord not just in my worship and not just in my family, but in every facet of life. When I go down to the Lord in the very heart of my being, to the very core of who I am, to the very center of my soul, then that then comes out and I will trust the Lord in every avenue of life. I will trust Him in my family. I will trust Him in my work. I will trust Him in my recreation. I will trust Him in my works. I will trust Him in my words. I will trust Him in my sleep. I will always trust Him. In every facet of life, I will trust the Lord. Well, then storms of life start to come and a prong gets broken. You still have five prongs holding up that ring. For Solomon, he never developed a pronged faith. And so when the pretty little woman came knocking, his trust in the Lord fell. For us to withstand the changes of this age and for us to withstand the assaults that Satan will throw at our faith, we need a heart that then trusts in the Lord in every facet of life. 
both in depth and also in breadth. Well, when we do that then, what do we get? You know this, this image of a tree? Why did I put this tree up here? Well, it's a pretty tree, but there's really a more proverbial reason for this. Much like the man in Psalm 1 who is rooted, who is planted by streams of water, When our heart trusts the Lord, and when we walk with Him in every facet of life, we must fill our heart with the right things. Go with me back to Proverbs chapter 1, please. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. So here's where we are. Let me do just a real quick review as I bring everything to a close. Solomon gives two choices. Walk the way of the righteous or the way of the wicked. In order for us to walk the way of the righteous... We have to walk with all of our heart. The very center of who I am must be given over to the Lord so that then when the center of who I am trusts in Him, I will walk with Him in every facet of life. So that then when assaults on my faith come, my faith won't be shaken and the ring won't fall apart, but my faith will be solid because I have trusted in the Lord with every facet of who I am. Well, what then do I fill my heart with? What do I fill my heart with? Proverbs 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To understand words of insight. To receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands abstain obtain guidance, to understand a proverb and saying the words of the wise and the riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. What must the heart be filled with? The heart must be filled with wisdom, with wisdom. Now, this is a fascinating term. I'm going to make another connection back to your Torah class this morning. In Exodus chapter 28, God commands that the high priest be given a certain robe, and it's very intricate in all the details. God then says, there's going to be specific men who I will give over to make these things. Oholiab and Bezalel, you learn their names in chapter 31 of Exodus. He says, I'm going to fill them with a spirit of skill, or as some of your translations may call it, a spirit of wisdom. Wisdom, I think, best understood is skill. It's skill. Now, we understand skill sets, right? All of us are skilled at something. I, for example, growing up took piano lessons. I am nowhere near the musician that Dan is. But I can still play a little bit of piano. How do you learn piano? Do you learn down and just read a music theory book? And yes, I can sit down and play Chopin? Of course not. It takes practice. It takes knowledge. It's a skill set. And then you learn how to do octaves with short little fingers. You learn how to do arpeggios and you learn how to do staccato. You learn a skill set. For some of you that are skilled at sports, athletics, at cooking, at sewing, there are skill sets that you developed. Christianity is a skill. It's a wisdom. Wisdom is skill, the skill of living. And what we must fill our heart with, brothers and sisters, is godly wisdom. Wisdom. Because wisdom says, trust in the Lord. Wisdom says, fear the Lord. Wisdom says, I will teach you how to walk this chaotic path of life. Wisdom. A skilled piano player can sit down to a piece they've never played and sight read it. They'll get to some notes and some chords and some arrangements that they've never played and they'll be able to just play it seamlessly. A wise Christian is able to come to a moral dilemma that they've never faced and understand. I may have not faced this before, but I can use godly discernment to figure this situation out. What about the transgender movement? Again, back to something that we discussed this morning. This is something very new for our age. Never before in the history of mankind has something like this been offered. Now, very briefly for that, I think transgenderism is the perfect storm of modernism and postmodernism. Modernism offered that science and empiricism would be the God that would cure all. Postmodernism says, no, be your own God. Well, here's what's happened. Science promised 
Fix your body so that materially you can be who you be. Postmodernism says, oh no, create whoever you want to be. We've had a perfect wind of two different philosophies come together and the world doesn't know what to do. Now, while we can look back to biblical history and understand similar aspects of identity issues and sexual issues, this is an issue that our generation is having to face that's unlike one that probably any of you have faced in your lifetime. The wise Christian will navigate this path with skill. The wise Christian will navigate this path with discernment and knowledge and instruction and wisdom. Because when I get to a path and I don't know exactly which way to take, do I go this way or do I go that way? The wise Christian is skilled enough to know how to act, to know how to think, to know what decisions to make. Brethren, what we must fill our minds with and what we must fill even more so our hearts with is godly wisdom. And ultimately, as we fill our hearts with wisdom, that means we turn our hearts to Jesus. Last text for the night. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, please. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2 verse 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, for those at Laodicea, and for those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding, which is the Messiah, the Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The Proverbs is merely the shadow of the substance of Christ. Much as the Old Testament tells us, Hebrews 8 through 10 tells us, the Old Testament is the shadow, the New Testament's the substance. The instructions of Proverbs are true, but they are but shadow of what has been given in Jesus. What we must understand is Jesus embodies God's wisdom. Jesus embodies God's skill. All of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus. And brethren, if we want to navigate this life, and if we want to raise our children and our grandchildren and perhaps even great-grandchildren to walk the path of the righteous, the heart must be inclined to wisdom. Because much as this morning, when my heart is filled with God's wisdom, what need do I have for the world? What could Satan possibly give me that Jesus hasn't already delivered? When my heart understands all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus, then together we can walk the path of the righteous. You can be eating your songbooks out at this time. Well, thank you again for your kind attention this afternoon. I hope that the things that we have studied from the scriptures have been useful for understanding how to navigate this chaotic age. Because in Acts 13, David served the purpose of God in his own generation. And we are called to do the same. I'll get soapboxy just for a second. I'm a millennial. Some of you hear that term and already scoff. I'm very proud to be a millennial. Do you know why? Because I have the wisdom of Moses and of Solomon and of Paul to guide me through this age. And above all of that, I have the crucified Lord who has been resurrected to show me how to live this age. And while Jesus may have lived in first century Galilee, I want to use their wisdom and much like David, serve God's purpose in my own generation. Oh, this generation is confusing and there's time after time that I just scratch my head and just don't know what to do. But if we look to God and we look to His wisdom, understanding that the answers may not always be easy. Understanding that it may take meditation and skill and wisdom to understand how God would have us to act. What chance does Satan have 
when we are emboldened with God's wisdom. For the invitation this afternoon, I direct your minds back to Proverbs chapter 3. At the end of this section, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. She, that is woman wisdom, is a tree of life to those who laid hold of her. Those who hold fast are called blessed. Isn't that beautiful? What did Adam and Eve try to do? They tried to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that then they could be wise in their own eyes and could be like God. The one who fears the Lord and who submits to God's wisdom, they're not going to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's already laid out. But she is a tree of life to those who, hailed, to those who lay hold of her, to those who hold her fast are called blessed. As you finish the end of the Bible in Revelation 22, once more you find the tree of life. The Lord and the Spirit, they offer the one who has endured eat of the tree. Eat of the tree. The path that we are on is going to lead to one of two places. On the one hand, the way of the righteous will end in the tree of life. Now what fruit that is, I'd love your theories. I'm hoping it's apples. I love apples. But whatever fruit, whatever tree that is, you will get to eat of the tree of life that Adam and Eve were never given the chance to. Walk the way of the righteous. Trust in the Lord. And walk in his way in every avenue of life. The way of the wicked is much different. Her way leads to death. Before us we have the choice not just for foolishness and wisdom. But before us we have the choice of life and of death. If anyone needs to respond to our Lord this evening. I ask you to come forward as we stand and sing. Do is God.